Thank you for that very rock and roll introduction, Jerry. <laughs> I'm not sure I can live up to it. Um, and thank you to Vera for asking me to talk this morning um, to the um, for, to deliver the early career researcher keynote. And early career is a kind of pretty tricky concept, isn't it? And uh, it's, I guess for me, I kind of think about it as people who are doing doctorates, people who've just finished their doctorates, and probably in the audience, a lot of people who work with people who are doing their doctorates. And certainly in education, uh, lots of people, as I did, come to their doctorate quite late in their careers. Um, and the notion of this being another career is a kind of odd one, although in my case it certainly was true, as like some of you, I think I used the PhD to kind of move from schools into higher education. Um, I probably need to start by saying that, like you've just been invited to do, I wrote the abstract for this presentation quite a long time ago, and it's one of the <laughs> things that happen, of course, is that you have an idea in your head, you write an abstract, and then as time goes on and as you start to actually work with it, it becomes a little different. Um, and this keynote is probably no different than some of the papers that you're going to give yourself now or you'll give next year. Um, it's slightly moved on in its um, intention and nature, although I do cover some of the things, well, in fact, all of the things that uh, I said in the abstract I was going to do. But the actual title, I think, no longer quite fits. Um, you'll see in the title I've got this kind of notion of manufacturing, and uh, you probably can read from that that I was, I was thinking probably a bit sort of Foucault-y, maybe a bit kind of Lyotard, a bit sort of performance-oriented. And the more I got into the topic, the more I thought, actually, I'm not sure that I really understand this impact thing um, particularly well. And what might be helpful is if I actually try and share some of my thinking about what this impact agenda actually means and what it does. So that's, that's what I'm going to do today. Um, so you'll, you'll hear what I, I often call thinking in public. Um, so none of the things I'm going to say I'm particularly, you know, irrevocably committed to, but I'm trying to work out for myself, um, as someone working in higher education, um, how it is that I might position the research that I want to do, not only so that it might meet a kind of an impact agenda, which I have to do as part of my job, um, but also how it might actually do something that makes a difference in the field. So that's, that's the kind of dilemma that I'm trying to think about now. Um, and some of you may know that I've kind of recently been having a bit of a think about presentations, probably prompted by uh, doing this one. And I've been thinking about how it is it might be helpful um, to actually tell people up front what the kind of big message is. And I think I wrote something recently about kind of flipping the presentation format. And so true to that, um, I'm going to tell you now that what I'm wanting to argue, I think, or try and explore, because I'm not sure that's entirely an argument yet, um, is to say that um, I'm not anti-impact, but I am thinking that at the moment that the impact agenda requires us to think quite reflexively. And by that, I think I'm probably referring to the kind of work that was done by Giddens and Beck and those kinds of people about contemporary life being one where you have to think all the time about what you're doing. You can't just make a decision and let it sit. In fact, you've got a kind of everyday process of thinking about what you're doing and why you're doing it. And I think that's how I'm thinking about the impact agenda, that it is something that I have to think about quite frequently and make a sort of small decisions about um, quite a lot. And I think in order to make those decisions, I have to call on quite a lot of intellectual resources that I have at my disposal. And I think they're historical. I think it's very helpful to think historically. I think they're politically uh, they, I think politically, I think, and, and because I'm um, so, uh, primarily a kind of sociologist, I, when I think politically, I tend to think sociologically, as you'll see. But I think we also have to think about the institution of, and the nature of the institution 
that we're working in. Now, I'm not assuming here, by the way, that all of you um, are currently in higher education or indeed intend to stay in higher education. And I think the impact agenda, and I, you'll see later as I pick it up, I think the impact agenda has quite interesting kind of implications for how it is we think about um, where we might want to locate ourselves in the scholarly work that we do. So I'm going to call on my old friend. <laughs> um, now, I often get asked to talk to people about using social theory, and I tend to write a bit about social theory. I write in textbooks about using social theory. Um, and one of the things I often say is that social, social theory actually helps you think. It, does, it, does the, it helps you actually sort out the kind of thinking you have to do before you do a research project. Um, so it's not something that you necessarily kind of seize on, hard, although sometimes you do come to something because you've got a sort of set of data that you really want to explain and you have to look around and find some social theory that's helpful. But for me, because the kind of questions I've always been interested in, my kind of longer term agenda, is about you know, who gets what and who benefits um, in education generally, I've, I've, you, I've ended up with kind of Bourdieu as my default kind of social theory. And it's become part of my kind of thinking process, really. And I'm sure some of you will have other bits of theory that you sort of use in the same way. Um, it just becomes part of the way you try and think about the world and think about the kind of problems that there are in the world. Um, so today I am going to, t going to talk, going to use Bourdieu. My apologies to those of you who are Bourdieu scholars. This is going to be a bit lightweight. For those of you who don't use Bourdieu, I kind of apologise for inflicting him on you and I hope that I, <laughs> I can do enough to kind of help you understand um, how it is that I work with him. Of course, there's no right way to work with any of these social theorists. I mean, there are a bunch of people who think that there's a kind of correct way to work with any social theory. But this is just a way, really, of helping us try and understand the world. And when we talk about social theory, of course, we mean people who've made an effort to try and understand the world writ large, as opposed to someone who develops a kind of more narrow sort of conceptual framework. So I'm going to try and have a, have a bit of a go um, at, at thinking with Bourdieu. And so in order to do that, I have to kind of just flag up a few of the kind of key ideas that I'm going to be working with, which I'm then going to try and use to work with on the question of impact. So the way the kind of paper presentation is going to go is I'm going to do a bit of stuff around um, Bodger and the kind of key ideas that I'm going to play with, as I said. Then I'm going to have a very quick look, and here again, apologies to the educational historians who will probably um, really you know, be out, out for me at the end of this, although I hope you also can see where I'm trying to go with that. I'm going to have a bit of a look at the kind of post-war policy settlement and then the kind of big adjustment to policy that happened um, and that we're living with now. So I'm going to look at those kind of um, two things and then look at the way in which the impact agenda, if you like, as it's being um, talked about at the moment by various kinds of people, how that might, how, how understanding those two kind of policy settlements might actually um, uh, help us understand how we respond to impact. So the kind of key ideas really that Bourdieu had, um, and he often, you know, likened things to a game of football. Now, he was, you know, white, pale, male, dead, etc., etc. So he always talked about rugby, which he played, but I've, I've chosen to put up a kind of women's football team. But the reason he used that metaphor was because he wanted us to understand that things aren't static, that society actually is always moving and changing. Um, and whenever we do a bit of academic work, we actually kind of take a snapshot and we freeze it. But it's always moved on, actually, from, as you know, in your own research, things move on very quickly. You know, you, you generate a bit of data and then things have already changed by the time you're trying to make sense of it. But Bourdieu talked and he developed this kind of metaphorical language, if you like, being a 
a kind of hybrid anthropologist sociologist. He developed this set of sort of verbal tools, if you like. Um, and the key one um, to me is about the notion of a field. And so he understood society as being a bit like a bit like a field. Um, and it wasn't, a, it wasn't a level playing field, you know, which is part, of course, why I'm drawn to Borgia, because I don't see society as being a level playing field either, any more than I, I imagine most of you don't. Um, you know, so it's organised um, in a kind of a hierarchy of status. Um, you know, and, we, and that's really a kind of a key idea, this kind of notion of hierarchies and the way in which hierarchies are formed and developed um, is a kind of key, uh, is, is really the key problem that, that Bourdieu set out to explain. And he saw specific areas of society as kind of subfields, if you like, so politics was a field and economics was a field and education is a field as well. And those fields kind of mirror the big social field and they help make it as well. So, you know, in the in Bordurian language, they produce and reproduce the kind of wider society. And of course, education is particularly important, um, and it was particularly important to Bordeaux because it produces the qualifications and the knowledge and the skills and the people who are actually going to sit in all the other and run all the other fields, or not run them, as the case may be. Um, but Bourdieu, you know, he said that although, you know, things are in motion and there's always contests in fields, there is this kind of tendency to reproduce the status quo. And so this kind of notion of reproduction um, was one in which, which is what most people sort of associate with Bourdieu. So, you know, in, in understanding the way that fields work, I mean, he talked about the different things being at stake. If you think of this like a football field, then, you know, the number of goals you get is what's at stake um, in the game on the field. So he talked about fields as having games and various things, various kinds of what he called capitals, being at stake in the field. So obviously in education there's social capital, cultural capital, who you know, what you know, <laughs> And also the kind of qualifications you get is kind of that are symbolic of the, the stuff that you get in the field. And he also said that, you know, there are sort of just as there are in a football field, there are positions. And people jockey for position and people jockey to either improve and certainly not lessen their kind of position. And there are kind of logics to what they do in relation to their position. So I'm not going to go on any more about that, but the key idea here, I think, the key ideas here, I think, really, are about hierarchies around contestation and change and the tendency to kind of reproduce the sort of hierarchies. But these are not fixed. They can be moved in various ways. So the balance of power can kind of shift in fields. The other thing I just want to say is that Bourdieu was very clear that fields are not themselves necessarily level. So education particularly is one of those fields that's in a kind of subservient position to some other fields, particularly the political field. And as I'm going to argue, education has become more, more subservient to the kind of uh, political field over the last 50 or 60 years. So I've got my own little diagram. I mean, I'm sure Bourdieu would absolutely hate this, right? So, you know, but hey, nobody else has this kind of diagram, I think. But, you know, this is kind of like the way, as I said, this is me thinking in public. This is the way I try and think about what Bourdieu actually meant. Um, and so the key thing, I think, actually, just to kind of put it in perspective, is to understand the sort of vertical and horizontal hierarchies that get set up in the field. And we can think about that fairly clearly. You know, what you learn in university is, is of the higher status and more important than what you learn in preschool. I mean, we might actually want to debate that, but <laughs> this is kind of the way the world is actually organised. Um, and that's why, of course, you know, leaving school without any qualifications 
is so bad for young people because they have nothing they can cash in in other fields. They have no symbolic, nothing that represents what it is they know that's actually given to them um, by the education system. Although, of course, they might actually know a lot, but they haven't learnt the stuff that actually matters that gets you the qualification. Now, you can probably guess by now, at some point, I'm going to come round to Ofsted and cultural capital. <laughs> <laughs> and indeed, I will towards the end. Um, but there's also, of course, there are these kind of horizontal hierarchies. And, you know, I often work around uh, alternative education, or, or, you know, which is offered to kids who don't make it in mainstream schools. And there's no doubt that you know, alternative education is way off to one side in terms of schooling as a field, in terms of that kind of horizontal sort of hierarchy, whereas at the other end we've got the kinds of schools that uh, the current government went to, uh, or most of them, or got scholarships to go to. So we know those kind of hierarchies that exist. And this is, of course, why I find Bourdieu so helpful, because it does it does allow you to kind of talk about those sort of status differences. Um, so it's helpful to kind of think about how it is those hierarchies are actually sort of how they happen and what it means to be on one side of a horizontal kind of stratification as opposed to another. And you can hear the kind of stories that we tell about these things. So, you know, over on this end where we've got alternative education, for example, these are kids who are generally said to be good with their hands as opposed to kids over here who are said to be good with their heads. So we've got the kind of head-hands binary that is part of the way that, as it's enacted through curriculum and through pedagogy, that's one of the ways that people are actually positioned um, in institutions, within institutions, but also their institutions are positioned across this kind of horizontal sort of um, arrangement at any of the levels in schooling. And in higher education, you can think, I think as James Ladwig um, argued in, the, in actually his own PhD in a book from the PhD, disciplines are organised on this kind of basis as well. So we know in higher education that the STEM disciplines are valued more highly than those in arts. Um, although we could have all kinds of arguments about that, but we know that also to be a kind of a truth in our own existence. One of the kind of key differentials that I want to think about in relation to impact is this kind of differential between that's made between theory and practice, the vocational and the academic. And these are kind of skills and knowledge. Right? This is a kind of uh, way of thinking now which is riven right into the current kind of school policy. Um, and there's also, of course, the way in which the stories that are attached to the way in which people are sorted out through upwards, through the kind of curriculum and the way in which they are, in fact, tipped out as well, often happens through this kind of view of some people having ability and other people not, some people having merit. I mean, I can certainly, I'm, because I'm incredibly old, I can certainly remember um, when, you know, women were considered not to have merit um, in, in certain kinds of uh, organisations like the public sector, for example, um, in Australia and in the UK. Um, and it just so happened that it was uh, men who seemed to have merit and women didn't. Um, excellence is another one of those kinds of stories which... Um, which divides both horizontally and vertically. And outstanding is another. And we can hear kind of, you know, the Ofsted kind of language, a lot of language that's uh, endemic in, in our own institutions, which is actually part of this process of sorting and sorting and selecting. And anyone who's looked at, for example, um, the teaching excellence scores, I mean, we know that these are not are not sorted by nature of higher education institutions. Um, but nevertheless, the kind of institution that I belong to, um, a Russell Group University, still has more kind of status. And that's to do with 
Um, in fact, my, con my colleague Monica McLean has done a one did a wonderful study with some with some other people um, of teaching sociology teaching undergraduate teaching and showed in fact that the teaching in uh, post 90 post well you know the ex poly sort of sector was as good if not better than that which happened in the Russell group. But this doesn't actually change. There are other things that go on, these kinds of stories about what counts as excellence are used to kind of sort between higher education institutions and between schools. Um, so that's, that's me kind of run through Bourdieu. Okay, so I hope I haven't kind of left your under, under the table. I, I haven't given you any sentences with, you know, multiple clauses that are meant to kind of make you stop and think. Reading Bourdieu can be a bit tough. It's a bit tough for people who are used to the kind of English language writing tradition as opposed to the kind of French writing tradition, um, which is quite different at the kind of syntactical level. Um, but I hope that's enough to sort of let you know the, the key kind of ideas I'm going to be working with. So I just want to think a little bit about what happened in Britain um, and also indeed in kind of associated countries like Australia. You can hear I'm Australian. I've been here for 16 years. But, you know, when I went to school, actually the school system was very like that here. Um, in, <coughs> in Britain, not surprisingly, given Australian, uh, Australia at that time was still very, very kind of um, attracted to the monarchy and it hadn't really entered its sort of republican struggles um, and its understanding of itself as a colony. But <coughs> in the kind of post-welfare state, there was, I think, in the welfare state, there was everywhere, I think, a kind of in, in Western countries and in some others, a kind of nation building phase and schooling was really important to that. Um, and as we think going through the kind of 60s and 70s, we can think about as well what emerged during that time are lots of, lots of um, I guess, sort of um, challenges to the kind of status quo generally in society. So outside schools, we had things like, and I will talk from an Australian perspective now, we did have, you know, the women's movement, we had an anti-apartheid movement, there was a land rights movement in Australia to do with, uh, to do with recognising what had actually happened to traditional owners. Um, there was gay rights, um, you know, there, so there were a number of kind of social movements, many of which affected what, in, say, in the field of the broader social field, many of which affected what could actually happen and what did happen within particular fields. And I think in education in Australia and, in, and here in Britain, there were lots of moves around trying to make the curriculum more inclusive, um, trying to um, shift the kind of way in which pedagogies um, were enacted in schools, um, changing relationships between parents and communities and schools. And there was, if you like, a kind of more democratic sort of impulse um, in wider society and it also within the kind of education arena. And in the field of education in particular, um, some pretty interesting things and important things happened. So the kind of division of schooling that there was between the kind of grammars and the secondary moderns was serious, very seriously kind of a, an attempted to change. I mean, people very seriously worked on it. I'm sure some people in this room were involved in the kind of move to comprehensivisation and that view that um, it wasn't acceptable to divide children at the age of seven, uh, at, at the end of year six, into um, those who were destined to work with their hands and those who were destined to work with their heads. Um, so there was some real undercutting um, and real challenge in, in two the way in which the field had been hierarchised through particular forms of schooling. And of course, polytechnics became universities. There was the same kind of impulse. Now, we can kind of understand that even though different kinds of schooling, if you like, were removed, there's still hierarchies that go on. There's still status, you know. But for most of that, this kind of welfare state time, there wasn't 
there wasn't any choice of school. You actually went to your local school. And so most kids who were in the state system, apart from a few kind of places where grammars lingered on and still linger on and now provide a kind of basis for which to argue for um, uh, that kind of level of elite school within the state system to be re-established and grown. You know, it was the case that the hierarchies were more based around kind of postcode, if you like, than they had been before with the kind of secondary modern and grammars, where the secondary moderns were generally character, often characterised as being kind of full of, uh, you know, the great unwashed. And of course, we all know, and there will be people in this room or people who know people in this room who came through the kind of secondary modern system. It wasn't the case that you couldn't get to higher education if you went through a secondary modern school, but it certainly was the case when Britain when made schools comprehensive that there wasn't a much greater expectation that anybody could get into higher education, which of course um, at, uh, for a lot of this time was actually free, um, something which never was in Australia, I have to say. Um, so you know, what we can see during this kind of time, I think, is if we go back to my kind of diagram, is we can see there was actually a, a pretty thriving adult and community education field. And that had been there before the war as well. So, and there was lots of stuff going on um, in relation to adult and community education. For example, my own university was the first to have a chair in, our, in adult education and people um, were out teaching, if you can imagine, um, in mines and mills <coughs> after hours. You know, there was that kind of spirit um, within the higher education sector of trying to move, um, help people kind of get a sort of better education, no matter who they were or where they were. Further education had a lot to do because there was a lot of work still on, manufacturing was vibrant, there were a lot of apprenticeships. Um, there were kind of unarticulated pathways between adult education and further education. The preschool and early childhood sector was expanding, I mean obviously kind of slowly, but it was, it was expanding and there was a lot of activity around thinking around curriculum and pedagogy in the early years. Um, the compulsory years, there's a lot of activity around curriculum development. As I said, the uh, different kinds of curriculum making it more inclusive. Um, and, you know, it was still nevertheless a kind of stratified system. But um, it, wasn't, it wasn't one which was kind of frozen. And it wasn't one in which it wasn't possible to have pretty serious kind of debates um, and, and change. But it was certainly the case that if we think about teacher education, I just want to talk briefly about teacher education because I want to use it as a kind of example. Um, teachers colleges that existed for a lot of this time were still places where people knew about teaching as opposed to did the teaching, okay? So there was a kind of theory practice and we, we, that was embedded in the notion of the practicum. Okay, so the practicum happens in schools, that's where the practical stuff goes on, whereas the theory happens in higher education. So there, there's this kind of um, nevertheless hierarchy of, of theory and practice which is embedded institutionally. Fortunately, educators didn't take this for granted and this was a, a site of very significant um, struggle, if you like, in a kind of Borgesian sense of struggle. And it was very important in Britain and also in Australia and there were a lot of kind of connections between the two and I could have put up lots of pictures of people in here. I've just happened to put up a few. Um, we have speaking later to us in the conference another person, uh, Marilyn Cochran smith who we could equally have, um, I equally could have put up there together with Susan Lytle. But we can see this kind of move to try and disrupt this border between higher education and schools and between higher education 
staff and between teachers to say that together we can do something more than we actually might do separately. And so we get the kind of practitioner research and movement, we get the action research movement, we get the notion of critical friends working together on similar kinds of problems. And we also get in research methods, we get those ki these kind of conversations now about in research methods about research which might not have teachers as partners but nevertheless actually works very strongly for teachers. So it's done very strongly with the kind of in, a, a democratising and uh, for in, in, impetus and for equity. Right, so I really want to kind of establish this um, because this is a kind of tradition, I think, that we can now historically now have to think about in relation to the impact agenda and what it actually means. So what is there from this time, from these kind of discussions that are going to help us actually think our way through um, the impact kind of agenda that there is now? What is there about these notions of trying to, as Bridget Somick once said, um, live in each other's castles? Or, as Judith Stack said, I think, building bridges between the two kind of sectors, the two fields, schools and higher education. Okay, so now I want to go on and just talk a, very, a little bit about the kind of new policy settlement. Um, now, I'm not going to do this justice, and I'm going to present it as, a, as I did just then, as a kind of a homogenous sort of thing. Um, and, it, you know, of course, there are people who've written about this really beautifully, and I think, you know, my colleague Ken Jones' book on, on educational history is certainly one that, if you want to actually understand it in, you know, more detail than I've been able to give, um, is, is a really good read, as is um, certainly for this kind of second policy settlement um, you know, Stephen Ball's book, The Great Debate, is a, is a fantastic sort of easy summary and way into understanding the complexities of this next period, um, and I'm not going to do um, anything like that kind of job at all. Um, what I do want to kind of suggest is that, you know, obviously we associate this with Margaret Thatcher, but clearly there were kind of strands and threads of this, this, these lines of thinking which have existed for a long time um, in, in the educational field, but they kind of came to, a, a, to, the, to the fore really as a result of the kind of changes in the broader sort of social field. So, you know, as countries became more kind of globalised, they deregulated their money, um, as sort of technologies advanced and people got um, replaced by machines, as natural resources ran out, like the, like the coal mining um, in, in Britain, you know, um, people, we, we were into that kind of phase that people think about as deindustrialization and and you know then thinking about what replaces the old kind of manufacturing sector and in Britain it's clearly um, to do with information and with finance um, but uh, these these kinds of uh, changes um, play out in schools in in important sorts of ways um, you know the the, what we get for a start is we is we get a kind of an attack on the sorts of social movements that actually were, if you like, underpinning and supporting some of those kind of democratic impulses. So in particular in this country, the trade unions are absolutely kind of decimated um, in the 80s. And we also get particular new forms of policy which come in which are often called um, neoliberal, and there's of course a lot of critique about the use of that term, but you know it, it generally means uh, you know a set of isations. It doesn't mean marketisation, contractualisation, um, the kind of growth of audit, the sort of things that we that we know quite well and that we that we live with now on a sort of day to day basis. Um, in in education, um, you know. 
uh, lots of things happen, beginning with um, the process of kind of devolution, which created school autonomy. And in interestingly, I think at first that was part of a kind of a democratising trend. You know, schools were and their local communities were going to have more say in what their local schools did. But as that, as choice was introduced, it became something else and it becomes part of this kind of process of competition within the educational field which kind of re-hierarchises it in really significant sorts of ways, particularly when we get bodies like Ofsted coming in who provide a kind of institutional way to think about hierarchies in the field. Um, recently we can think about um, you know, the, the development of new types of schools, for example, in, you know, the kind of post-2000, you know, where there was once kind of grammars and comprehensives. I mean, now we've got, I think Steve Courtney, I don't know if Steve's here, but Steve Courtney, I think, has argued there's, there's more than 90 different kinds of schools now. And you can't arrange those sort of in a kind of horizontal hierarchy. The hierarchy is created through uh, the market kind of reputation and also through Ofsted. Um, so there's a kind of different game afoot in the education field, in the processes of creating hierarchies, creating status. And we know from some of the work that's been done by our colleagues, such as you know the late Jeff Whitty and Soli Power, for example, that you know, it's middle class parents who understand and can play that game of get, making sure that their kids get into higher status schools, even if they're all state schools. So there's a kind of period here where, you know, the kind of democratic impulse is, is really under duress and where there's a lot of um, activity from the political field um, in response to what's happening in the wider social field, producing and reproducing, which play out in education. Education becomes part of the way in which the nation state kind of justifies itself globally as well. And we get the development of all those kind of international league tables with the kind of countries organised um, by how well students do on these kind of tests. Um, so I'm, I'm glossing over this hugely, but I, I really want to kind of, I guess, emphasise that, um, you know, while I think in the kind of post-war period there was this kind of move to democracy and equality, it was in part associated with the massification of schooling. I mean, I've argued elsewhere that when schooling is kind of more and more people come into school for longer, you do have a moment when you know, you can be more democratic, but then the field kind of crunches down again, and I think that's what we've been, that's what we've been seeing, and that's what we're, that's the kind of time that we're in at the moment. Um, I think we can, or going back to teacher education, we can see that kind of what's happened with schooling. We can see that in part happening with teacher education. I think I looked at the UCAS. Um, site um, the other day and they list 16 routes now into teacher education. Um, on the one hand we can say that's great because lots of people can come in from different kind of different bases so things are often two things at once, they're both this and they're that. Um, and we can certainly see that's what's happening is the kind of blurring around what was once quite a hard border which is what um, the kind of teacher practitioner move was trying to undo. But that border is now much kind of softer between, in teacher education, between universities and schools. And the, the strong move, in fact, to put teacher education into schools using that kind of story about practice. So teacher, learning to be a teacher is about learning to do. We only need a certain amount of this academic stuff. And so, you know, we've seen all those changes in teacher education of, you know, the, the diminution of the importance of particular kinds of thinking subjects, philosophy, history, psychology, or psychology is making a bit of a comeback. Um, and sociology, you know, and we get, have had this kind of move to focus on the national curriculum, the practice, you know, and of course you can't learn how to control a class while you're sitting in a university classroom, that's a nonsense. Um, but, 
you know, that's the kind of rhetoric, the ivory tower boffins, as opposed to the practical in the schools, that's, that's been used partly to kind of justify and rationalise, or as Bourdieu would say, it's the doxa, that has allowed this kind of blurring to happen between um, schools and teachers. Now, if we think about Bourdieu, just for a minute <laughs> again, then, you know, it's not as simple as that. Um, because we also know that there's a kind of move in the kind of in schools to be very interested in research, and we have, I mean, indeed, some of these kinds of moves that have happened, for example, like the research ed or red movement, have had active kind of conservative government um, manipulation um, in order to get them to kind of happen. But we can see, I think, things that would have made um, people like uh, Donald Schoen delighted. Okay? Teachers are now publishing in rather large numbers, right? So many of them are doing doctorates, they're publishing their research, they're publishing about what they do in their classroom. And this is kind of competition, okay? This is competition for us in higher education. Um, you know, people are now running their own teacher education courses, they're writing their own books, they're claiming that they're the research area as well. Um, so, you know, what are we to do with that? You know, teachers are, um, a, a small number of teachers um, are very active uh, on social media. Um, some of that's a bit kind of tetchy, but there, you know, this, I think the last list I saw um, was about 4,000 teacher blogs, and some of those are absolutely enormous and have far more distribution than any of us actually have. So, um, even me, uh, and even my friend the Thesis Whisperer <laughs> has far more than I do. You know, some of this teacher toolkit has miles more than both of us put together. So, there's stuff going on here in the field I mean, what I'm really trying to say is we've got to get our heads around this. I don't know that I've entirely got my head around this, but there's a kind of change happening around not only teacher education, but also what counts as research. Um, and it's not kind of simple, is it? Because, I mean, you know, you can see from this, we've got, at, we've got multiple fronts to be thinking about. Adult and community edge, uh, you know, are really under duress now. Where, you know, compared to the post-war period when they were relatively healthy, they probably could have done with more. But it was kind of flourishing area. My own university um, got rid of its adult and community education department. It's diminished the kind of importance of it in its kind of own thinking, um, as well as you know the adult and community education that's actually funded and happens is really struggling. Further education, we know, is also really kind of uh, under duress at the moment. Um, and, you know, I mean, if I was running government, I'd absolutely be looking at adult and community ed and further ed to kind of mop up some of the sort of social problems. But that's not the way that the kind of current political field thinks. The early years are well, having had, you know, quite quite good funding, perhaps under the, under a kind of Blair government, or certainly better funding than they than they have now, is also finding it difficult. And of course, funding cuts across the system are just putting all kinds of pressures on people, um, on schools, you know, to get rid of experienced teachers, to find ways of selling things to other people, asking parents for. for um, additional support, um, you know, we're, we're all having generally, I think, in the education field, a pretty tough time at the moment, some of us tougher than others, and I think our attention as a, as a kind of group also is a bit divided about where it is you might actually step in and try and make your research make a difference, because there's so many fronts that we might actually pitch our research into. Um, but my, my interest in impact, I think, is around this kind of border between um, schooling and higher education. And I'm, I'm interested in that because um, it's, it's a subject to quite a lot of um, a discussion outside of higher education. Some of it is commissioned um, by government from higher education. 
And we do have some kind of good information now, I think, about how teachers are actually thinking about research. So the DfE report in 2017, which was commissioned from um, a, number, a number of people, including people in higher education, suggests that for teachers, evidence informed, and here of course we get the kind of story of evidence which I don't have time to talk about and other people have, have dealt with, but it's part of this kind of conversation, I think, about research and what, what it actually means. Um, so the Coldwell to, and all 2017 report said, for teachers, evidence informed teaching usually meant drawing on research evidence directly or as translated by school leaders to integrate and trial in their own practice rather than directly applying research findings. Teachers' use of research evidence was prompted by a need to solve a practical problem. For the more research-engaged teachers, research was part of the evidence base they used to achieve this. Most teachers interviewed did not feel confident engaging with research directly or feel able to judge its quality relying on senior leaders and other organisations like the Sutton Trust and the Education Endowment Foundation. The exceptions were those undertaking higher level academic study. There was some evidence from the interviews that teachers were feeling better equipped to engage with research over time. And a 2018 study by NFER and WEF reported that academic research has a relatively small impact on teachers' decision making. However, teachers believe that their schools have climates that support evidence use and teachers generally have positive dispositions towards research. Primary school teachers were significantly more likely than secondary school teachers and senior leaders were significantly more likely than middle leaders or classroom teachers to believe that their schools had a positive enabling research culture. So well, here I think the key idea here I think that emerges is that there's a translation process that's going on and the translation process is actually happening in the school. So it's kind of senior leaders or perhaps some teachers who are in themselves engaged in postgraduate research who are translating research for other teachers. And we can see that if I go back to um, these kind of books, we can see that some of these are are calling on research and translating it, although there is a whole uh, raft of books that very specifically do this. Um, and we can also see you know, the way in which some of the teachers who are active in this field and the senior leaders, so some um, who are interested in research and some of whom are talking about their practice, are kind of selectively um, celebrated and fated by the government. I'm not going to name any names, but I'm sure most of you are kind of, and it's happening in higher ed as well, particular people are kind of singled out um, and used in various kinds of ways. And um, their particular um, view, um, and, it's, and there are lots of views um, within this kind of field between the teachers and in higher education, but it's particular views that are congruent with kind of government policy that are being promoted um, and supported. And we've also seen, I think, over this kind of time, we've seen a kind of instrumentalisation of practitioner research as well. Um, it's something that Stephen Chemist, for example, who was one of the people who was instrumental in the, that kind of democratising action research, participatory action research in, in Stephen's case in, in Australia and every, abroad, I mean he's um, very well known for his work, um, has written about the kind of way in which the, the more sort of open-ended and equity-focused kind of practitioner and action research has been shifted um, selectively through government, particular kinds of government programs to, to quite narrow kind of focus on sort of what works. And I'm sure that some of you have had the experience of working in master's programs where we've, you've had teachers come in. It's a master's program which is based around practitioner research. And the problems that people come up with 
in the first instance are very often ones which is, you know, how can I get more of my students through the SATs, for example, as opposed, and of course action research is really good for this and when people are enrolled, you can have then a lot of conversation about well, what might be going on here and kind of get people focused on broader questions. But that's sort of indicative of this sort of the pressure that people are under that has been created in the field through these kind of um, hierarching, selecting um, sort of practices. Um, we've also seen, I think, a particular way of thinking about equity. So equity is now very, very much tied to achievement on quite a narrow band of tests and exams as opposed to thinking more generally about people's life chances and thinking about curriculum and pedagogy in a much richer kind of way. So we get this kind of narrowing and a very distributive, what I've talked about in other places, as a sort of distributive approach um, to equity happening. And it's about this time, well here's the kind of, this is the translation research that you can, that you can see. Um, and there's a lot of it. Um, a lot of these are, so we've got, you know, a, a calendar from Research Ed. Um, we've got, um, you know, so there's a lot of conferences, there's books, there's magazines um, that are all about translating research into practice for teachers. So people, um, you know, there's a kind of marker, I think, in actually, actually doing this. But there's also an appetite in schools, despite and at the same time as the research says that teachers don't generally don't do this, this is also happening um, at the same time. So what we now get at, at, this, at this conjuncture, we get this kind of story about research impact also happening. And the story is one which is congruent with a lot of what um, the, that kind of literature actually suggests, that what research is about is theory to practice. Okay, so, you know, in higher education we, we do and we think stuff, or in social research organisations we do and we think stuff, um, and somebody translate it, translates it and then it's kind of taken up in schools. Now, I'm not suggesting that this is wrong, what I'm suggesting is that this is not all there is. Okay, so of course a lot of research that, that we do um, doesn't translate easily into pedagogy and there is more work to be done on it. Some of our research isn't intended to be translated into pedagogy. Some of it might speak to policy, some of it might simply advance the way that we understand things uh, and then we might think about what else needs to happen. Um, so, it, but there is, I think, this kind of dominant view that's now coming through higher education, which is congruent with what's being the kind of dominant story in schools, that impact is about theory into, into practice. And that's, of course, entirely what that 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, that kind of strand of practitioner research of partnership research between higher education and schools sought to trouble and sought to democratise in interesting ways. Um, and of course some of that is able to continue. What's interesting to me, I think, is that thinking with Bourdieu allows you to ask some quite confronting questions. So in the hierarchy of research that's established, I think now through things like the Educational Endowment Foundation, we get the kind of hierarchy of research types, which you can see if you look, for example, at any of the literature around systematic reviews and how you might select papers for systematic review. We get particular forms of research that are considered to be more valid, more, more whatever, than other forms. Okay? And interestingly, these take the form of things that people in schools actually can't do. So if you're in a school, you probably can't do research at scale. If you're in a school as a practitioner researcher or any kind of researcher, you actually can't do a randomised control trial by yourself. That has to be done by people outside schools. So there's a kind of interesting, at the same time as we get the kind of 
this is about theory into practice, in higher education, we get a kind of, this is higher status, this is how we stay higher education. We do this kind of work. And of course, it's very seductive. And it's seductive, not least of all, because um, there is now money coming for us, coming through research councils to do this kind of work. Now, again, I'm not suggesting that work's not helpful. Okay, I do some work at scale myself. I mean, I'm more and more going to work at scale because it seems to be the only thing that people listen to because of that's the game in the field. So, you know, this is a complex and complicated kind of question. But within this, we get, you know, the kind of practitioner research, the small scale practitioner research is at this end, the kind of, it's not really research end, of a kind of horizontal hierarchy of research, which is also partly vertical between higher education and schools. So the kind of question for me is if that's the case, how, how do we actually now, given what's going on in our institutions, right, given that, you know, I'm, a, I'm an impact case study for the REF, for example. Um, given you know, the way that money is distributed to us, given the way that performance, our performance is managed and rewarded um, within institutions, the kinds of publications that are seen as important, um, and so on. How is it that we respond to this kind of agenda? What is there about the impact agenda that actually creates new spaces or old spaces for us? What is there about these ongoing conversations which try to undo knowledge hierarchies, which try to unpick notions of knowledge on one hand, skills on the other, heads on one hand, uh, you know, hands on the other? You know, how is it that we might be able to position ourselves within the impact agenda in order to be able to continue that work. And the very notion of impact is problematic, you know, because it's one to another as opposed to in partnership. And my colleague, um, and my research partner, actually, uh, Emily Pringle, who's the director of research at Tate, with whom I work a lot, says that whenever she hears about research impact, she always feels like a lab rat who's about to be experimented on. This is not helpful, you know, but there may still be, and there is, I think, and I've been trying to find it, kind of spaces within the, this kind of impact agenda where we can continue, I think, and perhaps even strengthen. There may even be an opportunity in this kind of complex, uncertain movement around the kind of higher education and, and schooling kind of border between academics and teachers, between academics and people in other social organisations. There may even be an opportunity to actually bring back some of that more kind of democratising work. But I think we have to think very hard about what and where it is. Now, I just want to give you an extremely quick example because I think if you know you like me and you pose all these problems, there's probably an onus to say, well, this is how I'm trying to think about it. Um, so I'm very quickly, I think, um, in about five minutes, going to try and show you one piece of research that I've been doing with my colleagues. Um, there is a URL that you can look at if you want to follow it up. Um, but I told you I was going to talk about Ofsted uh, and Bourdieu, okay? So Ofsted have suddenly discovered cultural capital. This is really bloody awkward, all right, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so, you know, there's an obligation now, I think, on the sociologists among us in particular to actually get out there and try and say that cultural capital actually doesn't mean what Ofsted think it means or has it stated in the national curriculum, well, wish us luck, wish us all luck, wish ourselves luck in trying to do that. But, you know, it's kind of on, isn't it? And the way that Ofsted, I think, think about cultural curriculum, is uh, cultural capital in the curriculum is kind of like this. Basically, they think that the curriculum ought to be in that kind of top corner. Now, for those of you, if you can read this image, <laughs> then you have... <laughs> You have the kind of cultural capital that the government thinks every child should have, and so do I. 
Okay? I do think every child should be able to understand and decipher what an image like that means, okay? piling together the kind of the Tories, Brexit and uh, the Lady of Shalott in, a kind of, in an image. Um, but da and down the bottom, quite deliberately, we've got Stormzy. Now, some of you will remember the recent kind of fracas um, which emerged about a very good report written by some colleagues in music about the way in which the music curriculum might be changed. And they, it, was, it, was a, it was a plea for a more dem democratic approach to curriculum, which was inclusive of what it is that kids were interested in, as well as this kind of more elite cultural capital. Um, and of course it just got bollocked, didn't it? And so I think understanding the way in which the critique happens is very important. And what happened was there was a kind of either-or discourse that, were, that was immediately mobilised. Either you learn the Lady of Shalott or you learn Stormzy, and don't they get enough Stormzy outside of school? Whereas, of course, what the report actually said was that not only should the uh, curriculum be more inclusive, but kids needed to develop kind of critical understandings of, of both forms of music, of all forms of music. It wasn't a question of taking any of them for granted. It was understanding what it is that these different musical forms and cultural expressions actually did. So the, the clear issue, I think, with Ofsted is that they think that cultural capital is something that only some people possess. So in other words, they don't see as, um, you know, generations now, for example, of literacy and media researchers have argued that, you know, kids come with different forms of cultural capital to school and it's the teacher's job to try and work with all those forms of cultural capital to, on the one hand, give all kids access to what, to what matters and, on the other, to help to actually change the curriculum to be more inclusive. So there's already a lot of research which addresses this kind of issue. Um, the question is, how do we get it to have impact? Now, in my own little way, I've been playing around with this as well. And so this is a project that I've been doing with uh, my uh, long-term research partner, Chris Hall, looking at the arts in 30 schools in um, England. And I'm just going to stop by saying that, you know, we've put the notion of cultural capital at the centre of it. Um, and we've tried to talk about how it is that the kinds of cultural capital that the arts actually work with, and if they work with it inclusively, and if they work with it critically and appreciatively, and if it's geared to helping kids become critical as well as appreciative consumers, cultural consumers, and active producers in their own right. And this happens in particular ways in schools using particular kinds of pedagogies with what we've called arts broker teachers. Then what happens is that all young people, um, it's not about passing exams. Uh, that's not the issue. Yes, they may or may not pass exams. The issue is that they are all able to participate in the cultural life of the community. If we understand culture to be about, um, in, in a way, meaning-making practices using different kinds of um, aesthetic platforms. So, you know, we're plugging away at cultural capital here. I know other people are too. Um, but then thinking about how this might translate into impact, I think, is an interesting question. Um, within my, and I'm just going to say one last thing, within my university, because this is part of a REF impact case study, we're being asked to demonstrate that this has an impact on policy. <laughs> Fat chance, eh? So, you know, we'll go through some motions about that, but actually the people that are going to do this uh, that make this happen are actually arts organisations and schools. They do have, by virtue of the kinds of changes that have happened through, you know, academisation, through the kind of national curriculum we've got, through the kind of inspection system that we now have which talks about cultural capital, there is actually an opportunity for them together to kind of play with this and make something happen. 
So what we're trying to argue within our institution is that impact needs to be at that kind of level. It isn't about getting change in policy because we've got, you know, snowballs chance in hell of, ha of that happening. We have, however, got a chance of making a difference in other places, and that goes back to that kind of relationship that we have within with schools, um, long-term relationships with partners, um, and seeing the kind of movement and opportunities that there might exist within the field at the moment. Thank you. Now I'm going to... Good morning, everybody, and a very nice presentation, keynote speak. I am uh, Muhammad Anwar from University of Education, Pakistan. Uh, uh, you talked about uh, practitioner research, and also senior teachers are translating the research. Uh, what I could find, uh, we could find from the literature and from the research on the uh, what works or translating uh, translation research. There is a huge difference between the world of researchers and world of practitioners. And if the practitioners are doing some kind of research, this question arises, how many practitioners can do that? Because practitioners always talk about the time. They couldn't find enough time to do research. And if somebody is translating research other than researchers, if the senior teachers are translating, so there are terminology, specific terminology, jargons, special context of research which only researchers understand. And we can assume that other teachers who are not researchers, they can't understand that thing. And the last thing, uh, what we can uh, see in the third world countries, and might I say in the UK as well, the policy makers uh, are mostly studied in private schools, the good schools. But the practitioners, uh, I'm guessing that we are talking about the practitioners who are working in the public sector schools. So when their research, their findings will go to policy makers, how will they respond from which they don't understand the context because they are not studying from the public sector schools? So this is a current scenario in translational research. I need your comment on this. Thank you. <laughs> and I think you might hold some of that and perhaps taken up with Ma with Marilyn as well. And it's probably a good a good kind of conversation to happen through uh, the conference. I think in this country there is part of uh, the process of massification, if you like, has been a kind of increase of the number of teachers who actually have postgraduate qualifications um, themselves and senior school leaders who have postgraduate qualifications. So it's not the kind of, I suppose what I'm trying to say is I, I don't think it's as simple as saying university and school. Um, I, I think the kind of class question that you raise is quite a serious one, and I, I do think that you know part of the 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 issue that we have in in trying to 
even have a conversation with some policymakers is that their reference point is a kind of school which bears no relation to um, many, of the, many of the schools. But it's also the case that people within the state system often don't have an understanding of the range of schools that there are within the state system as well. And I can certainly remember as head teacher of a disadvantaged school really wishing that some of my colleagues in kind of the more elite end of the of the state sector um, where they were kind of moaning about the occasional kid that bounced a tennis ball against the wall um, <laughs> would have my life for a day so you know I I think all of the all of that is true um, but I, I think I think that issue that uh, I think the issues that you raise are part of the conversation about how it is that we actually bring the two kind of sectors together. I mean, we do sometimes do different kinds of research. Teachers do have problems um, in t with time related to research, but other teachers might be in schools that are called research schools where they actually do have time, or they're in schools where there are leaders who see practitioner research as a way to actually do school change. So I think all those things are true. Um, and more besides. I think it's a very kind of complex picture that we're actually dealing with. And I wouldn't presume to talk about your, your local context. I, I, I don't know about it and I, I couldn't comment about it, but I, I think I do kind of understand the situation here and, uh, and in Australia. And I think it's, if there is a point that I'd want to make is I think we need to talk about this a lot more and we need to try and understand what's going on better um, in order to think really strategically about where and what we want to do. Thank you. One more briefly word. The main street program in the middle Yeah, hi. I just want to go back to your slide about those tweeters and bloggers and authors who are practitioners and the influence they're having on education, or on practitioners in the field. Um, because there's a definite shift in hierarchy towards white middle class men in that field. Um, and that obviously has an impact um, and there tends to be a particular bias in the kind of messages that they're putting out to practitioners. And what's your view of that and what should we be doing about that for those of us who are practitioners in the field? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, think that's, I think it's really tricky. Um, I mean, certainly I've seen people get into most unproductive kind of slanging matches, and I'm sure you have too, um, and the kind of trad v prog sort of debates on social media I think need to be avoided at all costs. Um, I, I think there probably is room in the kind of menu of these sort of teacher researcher um, events for people to participate. Um, and I think there, there is perhaps some sense that there are quite a lot of teachers who don't participate in the noise and babble and actually go for people who appear to be more kind of reasonable. Um, but there are, of course, some you know, celebrated instances, I think, of, of some people on social media who've been trying to tow, uh, if you like, a more kind of balanced position, who've come in for a pretty revolting kind of trolling. Um, and so I, I think, I, again, I think I'd probably argue that this is just something we need to understand and think a lot more about, um, how it is we actually work and support this kind of area. And I, I'm, you know, I'm not at all surprised, given that going on, that Women Ed, for example, has formed as a kind of women-only space where people just don't get engaged in all that kind of antler crashing at dawn stuff that, that goes on um, sometimes. But I, I think it's kind of emerging, and I don't think it gets better if we absent ourselves. Um, but I think it is a kind of question of how you position yourself in a sort of principled way to support particular kinds of views and discussions as opposed to um, the toxic. Can we do clap? A rock and roll. <laughs>